Good morning, everyone. This is Professor Todd Giles, uh, AR105 again, and we're on our third video lecture for the um, Baroque period for Chapter 10. And we're looking at Caravaggio now. And Caravaggio's true name is Michelangelo Marisi. And he is from the village of Caravaggio. Um, very early, he showed a great talent for painting and was sent to Rome and very quickly became somewhat famous and popular among especially the uh, Roman Catholic bishops and cardinals and other private um, wealthy people um, as a painter. Um, oh, he's controversial um, because he would actually paint real people as they were, as he saw them. He would actually bring in people off the street, uh, clerks, uh, even prostitutes, and pose them in his studio, in his apartment, and then paint them directly from life. So he wouldn't, he would actually pose them and clothe them in um, costumes and then go ahead and paint exactly what he saw. Okay, so he was a great mimic of real life. Um, one of the things he's known for is tenebrism, that extreme contrast between light and dark. Um, it's very theatrical, and it is very much within the mold of the Counter-Reformation of the Catholic Church, trying to bring people back to the church by, by being um, having great art and great buildings um, within Rome and then other places within their realm. Um, he had many, um, I'll, I'll call them students, but many of them were not direct students of his. Um, etchings and illustrations of his art were created. Copies were made of his art, and they were distributed all over Europe. And very quickly, many, many artists, even some of great acclaim, saw what he was doing and said, I need to do that. And they glommed onto it. One of those was Rembrandt. We see that later in his life. Um, he comes later after Caravaggio, um, and we'll see at least one other of those followers. Um, here's one of his first paintings after getting to Rome. Uh, Bacchus, this is um, a young male friend of his, um, holding wine in this hand and with grape leaves and vines and grape clusters in his hair, but it's not like Michelangelo's uh, sculpture of Bacchus, where the hair is actually made of the grapes and the um, leaves, this guy still has his hair. So he's painting exactly what I saw, what he has seen, and he's not changing that at all. He's really painting from real life um, directly. Um, one of his other great pieces is the shield um, with the head of Medusa, but it looks like it's a bowl holding the head down deep inside of it, but really this comes out towards us. So it's three-dimensional, it's convex coming out towards us where the visual, and he tricks our eye thinking that it's down inside the bowl um, because of the shadow that he's painted. But probably what he's most famous for out of all of his uh, great paintings are the three paintings that you see here, but most of all, this one. This is um, a chapel in a secondary church in Rome, um, and this is a cha side chapel um, that a family owned, and they've hired him to create um, a series on the apostle, Matthew. And here are the three, awful slide here, but the calling, the... Uh, writing of the Gospel of Matthew, and then over here, the martyrdom of Matthew. So uh, a full series showing his religious life as a Christian from his calling. Now there's an interesting story about this middle painting that this is not the original of the Apostle Matthew writing the Gospel. This is the original. Now this is a photograph, a black and white photograph of the original, the original would have been brightly colored, like this one. 
Um, but notice the dark and the light, the very dramatic, very theatrical feel, almost like a stage with actors with a spotlight on them and the background is left in the dark to get that contrast. Now, why isn't this one here? Well, it was rejected by the donor, by the patron. Um, this wasn't churchy enough. Um, the angel is a, a young girl. Um, her hand is on top and touching the apostle, almost moving his hand letter by letter by letter. And this guy is a common everyday guy. He's bald. He's furrowing, furrowing his brow. Like, what's going on here? What, what, what is this word coming out in my book that I'm writing? Um, he has dirt underneath his toenails. We can see his dirty sole of his foot. So he's bringing everyday people and putting them into his artwork, and that could not happen. So they rejected it, he painted it again, so what's different? He's writing the book himself with his own personality, but he's getting instruction from the Holy Spirit, although don't interpret this as the Holy Spirit, this is still an angelic figure, but he's giving, the Holy Spirit is giving um, the word to him through the angel as a conduit to it like this. And look what the angel is doing with its fingers. First, you need to have a genealogy. Second, you need to have the birth of Christ. And then you need to have that, and now you need to have that. So he's directing them. Okay, um, so here is the painting on the right. Oh, by the way, um, this painting was destroyed. It was in Dresden, Germany, and it was destroyed in World War II in the great firebombing that happened in Dresden. Um, absolutely awful. Um, museums and museums full of great art went up in flame um, along with thousands of people, um, but we have lost this forever. Fortunately, there have been, had been images taken of it, um, but it is gone forever. Now, the image on the left is this image that the book um, talks about pretty good um, and some writing about it. Um, in particular, but a few things that I want you to get out of it is, yes, here's Jesus. Here's the hand of Jesus pointing, but who is Matthew? Is it this guy pointing at his own chest or is he actually pointing at this guy? So one of the things I love about this piece is this duality. You have Jesus and probably Peter standing here and they are in uh, what the Italians of the 1600s would have thought uh, Jesus would have wear, sort of this uh, tunic and the cloak, but this is Middle Eastern. But then the people he's interacting with are wearing the clothing of the day of Caravaggio. They've got the puffy um, shirts, um, tights, they're wearing swords, the puffy hats, Feathers, very much that, um, almost the look of the Three Musketeers. Um, not the candy bar, but the, the story. Um, so they're all pointing this way towards this figure. And he's counting money. He's not paying any attention. Now, some people say this is Matthew. In fact, that's what I was taught in uh, art history in my college days. But I think this is Matthew. And here's, here's why. We have this light coming in from a window here somewhere behind us, not through this window. And it's creating this stark, dark, and light contrast line here. So I see this as the calling coming down. And it's right as Jesus is saying, follow me to Matthew. So he's pointing at him. He's saying it, but this is sort of like the power of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that comes down because it's coming directly right at his head. But he's not looking up yet. But I think it stops right here because it's in that instant. It's like a, a flash photo of what happened in that instant where he's about ready to be called and the light of God is coming in 
beyond the speed of light, but it ends right here. Here's the contrast, here's the contrast, then it starts getting a little soft, and then it ends right here. And I think in the next instant, it, poof, comes down, and his eyes are opened up by the Spirit of God. But at this instant, all he can think about is profit and money. Okay, um, there's lots more to say about this, the grouping, this and that. But a, one thing to point out is, have you seen this hand before? Yes, you have in the creation of Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. This is the hand of Adam. Now, a lot of people are thinking, well, why would Jesus have the hand of Adam instead of the powerful, full of life hand of God bzz, giving life to Adam? Another name for Jesus is what? The second Adam that Paul talks about in Romans. So here is that hand of Adam as the second Adam pointing at one of his coming apostles. Okay? Um, now, here's a few more of his pieces to round this out. Um, this is above an altar in the Vatican. Um, very um, emotional. You've got Mary back here with her hands raised, crying. Here's Mary, the mother of Jesus, one of the other Marys. And here's probably Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea putting the body of Christ into the tomb. Now, they're on this rock um, here. So that might be the lid to the tomb. There are rocks here and rocks here. But notice the dramatic lighting all coming in from the left, dark light, dark light, emotional, um, crying, there's tears, and then the dead Christ, very light in color up against the dark of everything else. Now, it's interesting, this would have been above an altar where the Eucharist was kept. So the bread and the wine would be kept there. And what do we see here? the body of Christ, the bread, the body of Christ. So as you would be as a priest or a parishioner coming to get the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, you would be looking up at this body of Christ, a very powerful testament and symbol of what you're partake, partaking of. It isn't a piece of bread, especially in Catholic dogma of substantiation what you would partake of is the actual body of Christ, not a memorial, okay? So very, very, very powerful for us. Um, some of his other ones, the crucifixion of Peter, and he's being crucified upside down. Absolutely wonderful. There's the head of that same guy from Matthew. Maybe he's made him a little bit older. Here's the same face that we saw earlier in the martyrdom of Matthew. And then this person crouched down. We can see dirt on the soles of their feet, dirt underneath their toenails. Um, there's no real blood yet, but we see this guy crouching underneath the cross to help lift it up as Peter is asked, to be, mar or to be martyred, uh, crucified upside down instead of right side up. Okay, some of the other ones, um, this awesome one, this is a horrible slide, of the conversion of St. Paul. Where's the light coming from? Here's Paul or Saul being knocked off his horse by the Holy Spirit. Where's the light coming from? Right about here above his body to light the horse and to light his arms. Um, and by the way, the guy who ordered that didn't like it because it's a horse. Horse is rear end. <laughs> and this one, uh, it's famous because this is the Virgin Mary, Mary the mother of Christ, um, at her deathbed, but she's not being lifted up into the heavens, but she's dead. She is dead, dead, and she's a prostitute, a dead prostitute. 
as a model.